agency collaboration. I am Steve Etzler with Business Development Institute. I would like to first thank our speakers, Christian Young, Global Knowledge Manager, Siegel and Gal, Andrew Dixon, Senior Vice President, Marketing and Operations for Igloo. I would also like to recognize our sponsor, Igloo, for making this event possible. And of course, a big thank you to you, our attendees, for investing your valuable time with us today. We have a very simple agenda. The webinar will run for 60 minutes. The first part of the program will be a presentation by Andrew Dixon. Christian Young will present after Andrew. The last portion of the webinar will be a moderated question and answer session with you, the audience. We strongly encourage your questions, so please submit them through the GoToWebinar platform. For those of you on Twitter, please use the hashtag pound BDI1, that's B as in Boyd, D as in David, I as in Ivan, the number one, so we may all follow the conversation online. The webinar is being recorded, and we will make the recording available after the event on demand. So with that, let's begin. Andrew. Thanks very much, Steve, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, my name is uh, Andrew Dixon, as mentioned, and uh, I am the VP of Marketing for a company called Igloo Software. Now, Igloo, we like to refer to Igloo as a company that makes modern intranets. And what makes them modern is that they're, they're very different from the internet that you may recall from the late 90s and early 2000s. In fact, they're far from what you would uh, come to know as an internet of the past, which is largely IT controlled and repositories of information that is basically read only. Modern internets help to bring organizations and people together, connecting people to people and people to information. And typically what you see is that we would either replace or augment an existing system. So think Microsoft SharePoint, uh, which is the predominant system in the market today, a homegrown solution, um, or some other third-party solution would replace that. What makes it interesting for organizations today is that unlike previous internet, these ones are end-user driven. In other words, end users can uh, certainly publish if given the permissions. Uh, they can configure and control certain parts of the internet to be able to match their changing business requirements. And an end user driven internet is absolutely critical to modern business today. But going along with that, they also meet all the modern or all the requirements of IT. So in other words, the requirements around security, integration, uh, configurability, all of those things that, that IT requires. So you can almost think of it as end user driven but IT sanctioned. And last but not least, any cloud vendor, any uh, cloud vendor that you want to do business with, you should think of more as a business partner than just a provider of technology. And when you think about that, a cloud vendor is there to be able to earn your business every day. They need to start by consulting on the business problem, uh, configuring the solution and branding it, integrating it with other systems within your organization, uh, supporting it and, and giving you upgrades uh, on an ongoing basis. So think of it as sort of a turnkey end-to-end -end service that you would be purchasing versus a one-time installation uh, that you deploy and only to be upgraded, say, three years later. So we know at Igloo, we know agencies well. Um, all of the brands that you see up on the screen there, including certainly Siegel and Gale, who we'll hear from later on, these are clients of ours, and we've been working with creative agencies for a long, long time. Uh, we understand their challenges, we understand the workloads, uh, we understand how some of their existing systems are not serving those workloads today and how we can address those pain points. Uh, what's interesting is that we also know firsthand about agencies because many of our employees actually come from there in previous lives. And it's in fact how I'm going to frame the rest of my presentation is basically tell little stories and anecdotes of the experiences those people had as they moved from a creative agency into Igloo and how Igloo could solve problems, fundamental problems at, at creative agencies that they never knew were possible. So I'll spend a little bit of time just stepping you through some of those challenges and how Igloo as a solution or a modern internet solution can address some of those problems. So let's start with expertise location. Each of the people up on the screen here are employees of ours. They all came from creative agencies, all doing different things here at the company. And one of them actually came from a very large agency as a, a community manager in a previous role. And the story this individual tells is that 
this person was um, on a on a business and just landed a contract with a major telecommunication provider here in Canada. And having won a big part of that that new contract, what they needed to do in order to put that over the line was to hire a very specific person who was an expert in social media. And so they set out to find that person. They recruited uh, for that very specific role, and it took a long, long time. In fact, they, at the end of the day, they never ended up finding that person. And as a result, they ended up losing that part of the business. The contract actually expired. Now, what's interesting is little did that person know, that, that project manager is overseeing that contract, little did that project manager know that he was literally sitting two desks down from a domain expert. This person was an expert in social media and had previously worked in a major telecommunication organization and had the bandwidth to be able to help out on that contract. So the irony was two, two uh, desks down, you had the expertise, you could have solved that problem, and in the end they didn't and lost thousands and thousands of dollars as a result. So if you were to look at how a modern inter internet can help out here, Modern internets are really designed to be able to help you locate expertise and people across the organization. And they do that through various uh, means, including a very rich profile that records things like expertise, areas of interest, uh, previous experiences, all of which are searchable. So you can very quickly locate the people that you need to go against the, the uh, contract that you're looking to land. And what's more, once you find these people, you can actually follow the work that they're producing. So you can always be updated on exactly what they're what they're doing now that you've located that expert. So that's that's one on expertise location, something that is very much highlighted for all the folks that came from creative agencies here here at uh, Igloo. Second one is near and dear many many people's hearts, certainly those within creative agencies, and it's all about the review process. Uh, as one person put it, uh, getting things reviewed in agencies is just about the hardest thing you can imagine. Um, they all have their own special tools. They all produce individual files that are highly specific to applications. Those applications aren't used by everybody in the organization. So as a result, you have these different file formats that really aren't easily able to be shared so that that review process can be conducted. In fact, one of the workarounds that one of the individuals said is done routinely in agencies is those files are all saved by a designer to a JPEG or a PDF format. Uh, something that can be viewed by most people in the organization. And then once they're saved, they're printed out as paper, if you can believe it. They're handed off to the people who need to review it. They're then marked up with red ink. Red ink. That then is going, goes back to the original creator to be put back into the system that was used to create it. That's how the review process works. And sometimes, even for the simplest of tasks, that can make it very, very inefficient workflow. When you look at a modern interest such as Igloo, all these file formats can be viewed uh, in, in one place. It doesn't matter what the file format is. They all can be viewed. They can be interacted with. They can be printed uh, without even going into the application that was used to create it. Uh, you can then comment on those files. You can rate them. You can even assign tasks uh, for different changes that need to be made to that file and have those tasks automatically show up with the individual that needs to complete them. Uh, or even do things like mo put moderation on a document so that they can only be published if the next level manager is there to go ahead and approve it. So one of the things that these, um, these individuals coming from creative agencies said is this could save a significant amount of time in the review process, which of course uh, takes a lot of time within, within these agencies. Next one I'd like to talk about, um, this by the way is uh, the perplexed, perplexed look of our, of our CEO. Uh, next one I'd like to talk about is, is this whole concept of pitching business. As you can imagine, Agencies spend a lot of time pitching business. And it's stressful. It's stressful not only for the, the team that's actually pitching it, but it's stressful for the, all, the, all who were involved in, in producing the pitch in the first place. Um, so they go ahead and make this pitch, and what happens is it goes into a black hole, the whole concept of, you know, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, and you never really know, did we assemble the right team? Uh, did we focus on the right key areas? Uh, did we respond quickly enough, or did our competitors beat us to the punch? Um, how do I need to change my pitch? And as a result, you either win or you lose the business. If you win it, everybody sort of pops the cork uh, on the champagne bottle, and they never really look into why they won that business. And if you lose it, they never really assess, well, what should we do differently? Where did we go wrong? And how can we correct that over time? So if you were to put that in a context of a modern internet, what you do is produce a project workspace. 
as a way to be able to plan for the pitch. Then you do searches for experts across the organization using uh, their profiles to be able to bring the right people against the project and the right contributors to help you uh, with that pitch. Uh, you would create forums, and forums can be used to do ideation, so you can gather information and ideas across the organization on the solution, and you can use microblogs and blogs to be able to share updates um, as you go through the process. And that would create a much, much richer and more informed pitch. And then after the pitch takes place, you would use that exact same workplace to debrief on what happened. What worked? What didn't work? How can we do this all differently? And when you record those ideas, that now becomes an asset for the organization that can be leveraged with pitches in the future. So a dramatically different way of being able to uh, be successful at pitches and learn from the ones that weren't successful. The last one I'm going to talk about is this concept of, of onboarding. And you know, of course, onboarding is not un unique to creative agencies. Uh, all companies have to go through it. Uh, but creative agencies are unfortunately famous for one thing and that for many things, but one thing is, is high turnover. So what happens is you have a high set of, of folks, new folks joining the organization. And then also another uh, element of agencies is they have highly regimented workflows, each of them different depending on the agency that you're in. And they all need to be respected and adhered to, otherwise uh, the result is, is pure chaos. And so all of these agencies rely on uh, basically explaining in person what these processes are and or passing around sheets of paper to be able to, to document them to get all of these newbies up to speed on, on how to basically navigate the organization and get work done. They don't have an easy way of being able to find resources or really access those, those policies. With the modern internet, what you would use is a wiki to be able to record policies and procedures that can be quickly referenced and accessed and updated as required for newbies to be able to navigate those, those waters. Um, you use forums for Q&A, so a new person can ask a question and quickly get a response so that they can uh, move forward. Um, and so uh, each, of these, each of these things uh, can help to be able to onboard and, and help uh, new users to be able to get access to the resources and information they need to be able to much more quickly come up to speed. So there you have it. Those are four use cases for agencies uh, and for which a modern internet can really be used to be able to dramatically impact the efficiency within that organization. So at that point, what I want to do is, is switch gears a little bit and hand it over to Christian Young, our global knowledge manager here at Siegel, there at Siegel and Gale, to be able to talk about the real learnings and what happened on the ground as they want to deploy a modern internet in their organization. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and I, you know, I will say um, I like that you you accidentally said here, uh, global knowledge manager here, and I think that's a reflection of something you said before. Um, that is, at the end of the day, cloud partners um, are partners. It's not a solution that you uh, pay for and update five years later. Um, I have literally weekly calls with Igloo where we think of how can we improve the intranet that we have um, and, and, and really innovate how uh, the people at Siegel and Gale work. Um, so to get into what uh, I'd like to share with you all today, um, it's, it, it definitely involves Igloo, but it also talks about some up stuff. Um, I am the global knowledge manager here at Siegel and Gale. Um, and that's not a discipline that a lot of companies have in general. And it's not a discipline that um, a lot of people in the marketing and advertising space um, have uh, especially. So we're going to go through um, a couple things. But before we do that, let me uh, share with you a little bit about Siegel & Gale. So Siegel & Gale is a global boutique. We've been around for 46 years. We're about 200 people. Um, and our core values are smart, nice, and unstoppable. And I hear time and time again that um, they, it's not just uh, you know, corporate fodder. It's, it's something that people truly do embody. Um, you, you can see below on the screen, those are our practice areas. Uh, those are all of the uh, service offerings that we have. Um, and something that you might notice, um, Q knowledge management is that these are not necessarily um, crystal clear service offerings. For instance, 
simplification. What on earth is simplification? Or naming. How many companies have a naming department? Um, and so that's that's kind of the point where Siegel and Gale said, you know what, we uh, we need to think about the knowledge that we have an, as an institution and how that moves around those different uh, offices that you can see on the map. Um, so in some organizations, uh, you know, you create widgets, and so the knowledge or the know-how, there are many words for it, that most closely align with the value chain are in fact, how do we replicate the same process over and over? But in a branding agency, where the best use of knowledge that most closely ties with the value chain is in fact novel idea creation and, uh, and in fact not, not coming up with the same thing over and over again. Um, it's a very different kind of uh, challenge and um, it's something that we refer to as tacit knowledge in the knowledge management world. So what you'll see here is a reflection of a knowledge management department and strategy um, in an organization that deals primarily with tacit knowledge. Um, but it's, I think it'll be um, very important as agencies look at improving the way that they collaborate because it's about strategic collaboration at the end of the day. Uh, this is how uh, our knowledge management uh, department is structured, um, keeping in mind who is informing it and who is uh, part of that steering committee that says yay or nay. Um, I think this is critical to um, having uh, at least the success that we've seen so far um, in that you'll notice there are very core people to how we deliver our work uh, represented here. We have our head of HR, we have our global um, leads for strategy and insights, content and design, um, account management, and project management. So um, when, when I'm bringing forth an idea, I get a really good sense quickly from this group whether it's something that will indeed generate new knowledge or uh, leverage existing knowledge or whether it's something we should maybe uh, deprioritize and, and chase something else. So um, this is the world that I stepped into when I first came to Siegel and Gale. Um, and so I'm excited to share with you then how from here um, we built out a knowledge management purpose, um, then a strategy, and all the way down to the execution of one particular case in particular, um, and, and we can talk, too, about what the rest of um, these collabor collaboration efforts look like. So going into defining a purpose, um, this, is, uh, this was a pretty fun task. When I got to Siegel and Gale, we had an intranet, but we didn't have a, a concrete purpose for the knowledge management department. And so that was the first thing that I undertook. Here is my approach. Um, as with developing any strategy, um, it had a um, very intentional uh, linear direction um, whereby I first did a discovery. I interviewed 62 uh, employees across practice areas, you know, internal people, external people, people in London, Shanghai, New York, San Francisco, LA, um, and, and also across um, job levels, so executives uh, to the people who are helping the executives and uh, internal folks as well. So I gathered employee ideas and you can imagine how uh, entertaining it is to ask people essentially what do you think I should do? <laughs> um, and especially in a role that is very, uh, that serves the organization. So people get some people said it felt like a therapy session where they got to just vent and say, here are all the problems that I encounter. I don't know what the solutions are, um, but that could be your job to figure it out. So I took all these ideas and categorized them into three buckets that made sense, how we do our work, what our work actually is, um, and, and this cultural element of who are we. Uh, with that steering committee, I refined these down and classified them into four buckets that made sense. Knowledge management, information technology, content collaboration, and in-person communications. And the last step is uh, 
is really the most important, I would say, um, maybe after gathering employee ideas, and that is aligning it with the company's strategy and the company's mission. Um, I discussed extensively with our C-suite to make sure that I understood that as I was um, creating the strategy, and also with people who have had long tenure at the company. Like I said, we're a 46-year-old company, and we have many employees who have been here for over 20 years. So I, I was sure to tap into what they knew about Siegel and Gale so that I could capture that ethos in how I built knowledge management. So here we have the purpose statement that I landed on. And I am, I'll am i read this out because I do think that the kind of going through it slowly helps um, to make sense of it. Um, so the short form of this is essentially that knowledge management will amplify our success by daring to work smarter. For 45 years, Siegel & Gale has built iconic brands by unlocking the power of simplicity and combining the remarkably clear with the unexpectedly fresh. In a world stifled by complexity, we thrive by navigating complicated systems and processes with simplicity. In a world disrupted by technology, we demonstrate our inherent truths by collaborating seamlessly across devices, ideating with cross-disciplinary teams, convening experts to problem solve regardless of geography. We craft a new way of working with technology that feels human. When we evoke a sense of humanity and how we work together, we extend the reach of our impact beyond our individual capabilities. It's important that I followed this format because this is how we talk about um, purpose at Siegel and Gill with our clients. Um, I, I thought it could, it helped the organization understand what on earth I was talking about when I said knowledge management. Um, and it, it also surprised people because a lot of people think that uh, knowledge management and disciplines very similar to it are about just cataloging as much as we can and tagging everything. But in fact, especially when you're talking about tacit knowledge, uh, forming human connections between people is the most important aspect to this. Morton Hansen is a, an expert in collaboration and he even wrote a book titled Collaboration where he talks about his theory on uh, the best form of collaboration that he names disciplined collaboration. And he re refers to tacit knowledge there and he says tacit knowledge is best shared when uh, the people who compose the organization both have a strong common frame, um, and so that refers to the processes in place um, so that they don't question how to do certain aspects of their work, and then that they have strong ties between them. So when someone brings the knowledge that they have to a situation, um, those receiving that knowledge and potentially building upon it understand more of the context that that person is bringing to the table. Um, it's essential when you think about tacit knowledge sharing, and so it's essential when you think about a knowledge management strategy at any organization like a branding agency or like any other form of um, professional services, really, uh, where it's essential to think about that human component. Um, so. That, there's kind of the purpose that I landed on, and so I'd like to take you through uh, one case that uh, I had here where we thought, you know, we could really use Igloo um, and the internet that we already have in place to try and uh, fulfill this purpose. So if we think about um, knowledge sharing and how people um, communicate with one another, one of the very first things is sharing information back and forth. It's very straightforward. It's, um, it's kind of the first step in any ideation process. Uh, if, if you're interested more in thinking about this knowledge creation journey um, that people go through, I'd recommend reading um, some of the work by Ikujiro Nonaka on the concept of BA, um, where he talks about these spirals 
embrace what they know and, and um, socialize that. And as others internalize it, uh, there you have a knowledge creation process. And so the more you can um, facilitate that as an organization, uh, the more you can eventually catalog um, and, and access for innovation's purpose later on uh, knowledge that was created as a result of the mechanisms you have in place. So, so here is the before. How do we share uh, just information in general? And this is what I got from people. A lot of link sharing in email, and that was about it. Um, that's clearly not ideal. We're all inundated with emails every day, um, and we'd rather not have um, potentially very interesting strings of emails going back and forth throughout our day um, where we might otherwise be able to um, ideate more effectively. Um, and, and email is certainly not something that we can go back to very easily. So this is what we have after. I'd love to take you through this because this is, uh, you're looking at a screenshot of our um, branded version of Igloo. We've named it Plus. Um, it is intentionally tiny uh, so that you can't read <laughs> what we're saying on the inside. Um, so, so what we did, uh, I have this group that I've created of um, knowledge management champions. They named themselves Multiply. Um, you, you may see why, uh, based on the fact that the internet is called Plus, um, use, playing on that purpose of amplifying. Um, so we have this global community called Multiply of people who have promised to um, help the organization dare to work smarter. And uh, we have these uh, chapters in every geography. Um, and this is kind of the output then of thinking, how do we improve the way that we just share general information? Um, we have at the top some photos so you can get a sense of that uh, human component um, of what ev every office is up to. Uh, you can see then um, a long, it's called the news feed. It's an aggregation of four different channels, um, classifieds, industry-related news, office activities, and a, a random channel that we let each um, office, each geography name themselves. So um, very apropos in New York, it's called Walk and Talk. Um, and then we have some upcoming birthdays and anniversaries cycling through there. Um, so this, is, uh, this was the output of thinking of how do we uh, share better. And it's something that um, we were very excited to collaborate with Igloo on, um, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about the process of rolling it out, because um, tools like Igloo are fantastic to enable this kind of collaboration, but it takes a lot of planning and a lot of uh, interaction with Igloo and with um, your employees to make sure that it's a success. So <laughs> I've, I've all told. Um, is is the best way of putting it. Uh, I had my multiply group, and when once I had designed uh, this space, uh, the geographic spaces, um, I I identified these three roles: the poster child, the social butterfly, and the matchmaker. Because at the end of the day, if you think about it, people don't know how to um, necessarily use social media to create knowledge. People use social media um, for their own personal purposes. Um, most of us are tend to be more of watchers than contributors. But when you think about a, an enterprise social media, uh, you want people to be contributing and contributing often. Um, so I, uh, thanks to um, the actually my own uh, past education, my for graduate school. Um, I studied information and knowledge strategy, and we uh, we had courses that were virtual where we got to learn how do you do this stuff online because it's not easy and it does take strategies. And so um, uh, Kate Pugh is is uh, a name that is worth following when you think about building virtual communities. Um, I leveraged some of what she shared with us um, when I was going through the program uh, to, to create these three um, roles. 
the, uh, the poster child you'll see says you post new content all the time, new articles, jokes, thoughts on industry trends, etc. The social butterfly. You are the social commentator. You notice a good conversation, contribute to it, and call out good behaviors. This is something that people definitely don't actively do. For the most part, intrinsic motivation leads them to do that in their personal social networks. Um, but it's different to think of uh, doing this for knowledge creation sake. Um, how can you galvanize a good conversation? Um, and then the matchmaker, you connect people. You see every exchange as an opportunity to widen the conversation, not narrow it, and invite others to it. This is a very important role when you think about um, uh, that concept of BA, that we're socializing what we know and applying our context and creating new value from that. Um, so I, I got my group together and I said, all right guys, I'm passing a piece of paper around. You are going to put your name on one of the days of the week and you are signing up for, um, for one of these roles uh, to do once a week. And I will email you um, weekly to do that role. And so we did that for a full quarter. Um, and it was a great experience in peer learning, people uh, kind of socializing as they were learning, um, and, and not being too timid to ask, wait, how I thought I would get a not notification and I didn't, or how do I subscribe myself to this because I want notifications on this. Um, so we got to learn the tool together as a team. This is a group of like 60 people globally. Um, and every office got to participate. It was going very well. Um, and, uh, and, I, and so I went back recently and I said, okay, how are, how are we doing in all of the different geographies? Because I'm personally in New York and I happen to look at that one more often than other people. I saw that we were using it um, very well for new hires where we had new hires answering a couple questions on their first day as a kind of informal introduction to the rest of the New York office. Um, but how did it look in the other cities? Um, and so two weeks ago, I visited our London offices. <laughs> I did not like what I found. Um, here I thought everything was going swell. Uh, it turns out I need to tweak um, the approach a little bit because um, I wasn't listening to all of my employees um, experiences and uh, kind of uh, work life. So in our London offices, we have about 20 people, not 200. Um, and they said, why am I going to post something interesting on this website when I can say it at um, a normal uh, speaking voice and all 20 people will hear me, um, which, you know, point taken. Um, and so it's time to uh, course correct, and we're going to be doing that in the next, uh, not this week, but the next week. Um, so it's, I, I thought it was important to show you guys not just um, what taking a purpose and a strategy, bringing it down to the execution looks like, but then what happens when it doesn't end up just like you expected. Um, so a couple lessons learned I had from this. Um, and some of them were more reminders than um, maybe a lesson learned. Um, but that was, of course, get to know your employees' needs. Um, because with any social intranet or social initiative in a workplace, if your employees don't see the value immediately of doing that, they're not going to do it. Um, and you shouldn't have to make them do it. There should be enough motivation there, and the value should be um, the kind of the value prop should be so present that, that they do take the time uh, to build that network online. Um, building trust is critical um, as you do this with people throughout the organization. So um, using maybe, if we have strategy experts in-house, use the framework that they have when you talk about the st strategy you're employing for your initiatives. Um, Having a group of cha champions and consulting with them regularly has been critical to me um, as I've rolled out various knowledge management initiatives um, and, and built them too and tweaked them. Um, this is your group that will tell you the brutal truth and they'll also pat you on the back when something looks right. Um, 
And lastly, don't be afraid to fail because it's gonna happen. Um, this has, you know, seeing uh, the geographic spaces roll out, I'm happy to see that New York is doing well, but this wasn't devised to be a New York solution. It's supposed to be a global solution. And so as a result, um, next week what we'll be doing is on the uh, intranet homepage, we'll be bringing forward the industry and the random um, microblogging to the forefront. So we're at the point where we know that people know how to use this tool. It's a matter of giving them the incentive and the um, platform to do that in a way that they want to do it. So London says, you know, we know what's going on um, in London. Great. Then let's let you, let's give you a voice uh, to the rest of the company. It's something that London uh, said would work really well for them. Um, and I, I uh, believe that in some of our uh, smaller offices, um, they would agree with uh, this because it, it was a symptom of a smaller office versus big offices. Um, so with that, um, just to go over again, collaboration with purpose, what does that look like from beginning to end? Um, we have our purpose statement that we've succinctly said, and, and frankly, this is something that, it, that I use not just to um, remind myself of why knowledge management exists at Siegel and Gale, but also why, for uh, specific things, why it doesn't or what it doesn't aim to accomplish. Um, a lot, you know, strategy, strategy um, titans um, like Peter Drucker, for example, have said over and over that, you know, a good strategy doesn't tell you what to do, it tells you what not to do. Um, so this is the knowledge management strategy that rolled out of the purpose um, that we wrote. And, and I wrote it specifically so that it could be um, read by the employees that are um, kind of the, the center point of it all, but also to the steering committee to understand. So it's a three-pronged strategy, a network strategy, a platform strategy, and a sustainability strategy. The network strategy is about leveraging the organizational network in a way that facilitates the strategic flow of information and knowledge. What that means for the employee is knowing how to tap the network to solve the toughest challenges. It's something that employees said resonated with them. The platform strategy is about creating physical, virtual, and mental spaces where information management and collaboration can flourish. And what that means for the employee is having the tools and spaces to work smarter than ever before. And lastly, the sustainability strategy is about innovating in a way that ensures long-term success for knowledge management at Siegel and Gale. And for employees, what does that mean? It means daring each other to work in new ways constantly. Um, so this was the strategy that uh, they rolled out of that purpose, and it's one that served, uh, served me very well um, you'll notice that in the platform strategy, a lot of times people think about just the virtual platforms and technology, um, but it's not just about that because knowledge creation and knowledge development happen um, outside of computers. They happen in people's brains um, and through conversation. So thinking of you know, having the right uh, communal spaces for people to convene in person, um, as well as giving them the right mental space um, are you creating an environment that, um, that promotes learning and that promotes um, exploration and discovery and, and, like we said before, failure? Um, that's really uh, all critical to having that space. Um, and, and for those who were piqued by the no-naka stuff, this is very much taken from that concept of ba. Um, and so... This has, here's just the last year, um, every quarter I identify sprints, and so we have sprints that um, align with the network strategy, the platform strategy, and the sustainability strategy. Um, the fact that these exist is, is absolutely um, a component of the sustainability strategy. Um, but you can see in here, um, plus comes up over and over, um, maybe not the word, but for instance, right now, 2015 Q3, we're talking about globalizing the conversations on PLUS. Um, and you can see, and Siegelopedia and the platform strategy, that's something that 
is happening on PLUS. Um, we're using a wiki to develop a company-wide wiki, standardize um, our onboarding process, HR distribution, um, IT instructional trainings, things like that, um, and uh, simplifying our group structure on PLUS to make sure that it's healthy. PLUS is all over here. Um, and so are other tools. It's, it's really a mix. It's not just one tool that um, enables knowledge management. It's a whole strategy with a uh, compelling purpose and the execution to make sure that that, um, that happens and that you course correct where you need to. Um, so that's all I have for you folks. I hope that was um, interesting, at least new, or gave you something to think about. Um, I think I'll hand it over to you now, Steve. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, Andrew, as well. Both of you um, gave great presentations. Uh, we appreciate all the preparation that you did. So the next part of the agenda is for audience Q&A, and we have some questions. Um, the first one is for Andrew. Let me just... change my screen here. Beautiful. So Andrew, you know the agency space well. What do they usually do wrong in terms of collaboration? And how do you think they can change? Well, one of the common elements across pretty much every agency that I've seen is that they need to adopt the same tools that their customers are using. And if you think about sort of the, the interplay between the agency and the customer, there's a tremendous amount of exchange of files and collaboration on files as the review process takes shape. And the challenge is that there is umpteen number of different file sharing tools available and about as many that are actually in use by any company at any one given time. And so whether it's Dropbox or Box or Google Drive uh, or any other tool that you may happen to be using, you usually have a situation where there's, there's such a mix of different tools and locations where all these files are stored uh, that it's very, very difficult to sort of rationalize and find that information. And what's compounding the problem is that in many of these agencies, um, they on purpose keep them smaller and they have very light IT uh, resourcing. And so IT isn't a, a force that can be brought into play to be able to help rationalize all these different user interfaces, all these different tools, all the different locations where these files are stored. And so um, not doing a good job of rationalizing um, that very complex matrix of file sharing tools is one of the challenges I see within agencies. And one of the solutions that a, a modern internet can bring where you can standardize and rationalize all of these different tools into one common user interface. Think of it as sort of a single pane of glass that doesn't really care where all of these applications or where all these files live. It's just able to produce them for you in, in one place so that you can work on them. Thank you, Andrew. Next question is for Christian. Christian, can you expand a little bit more on how you use Igloo for ideation or the beginning of a new business pitch? Yeah, um, that's, I guess, I, yeah, I didn't touch on that. So um, we've started exploring with the strategy team how we can use um, Igloo at the beginning of a pitch once we've gotten the RFP. And now, Twice we've um, we've used Igloo um, or Plus to send out kind of uh, global brainstorming, and we've had great success. Both of them, uh, we won the pitch, <laughs> so that's the, that's the, you know the big measurement. Um, well, that's good. Yeah, we can't say that that's you know solely because we did this one thing differently, um, but uh, <laughs> I'd get in trouble if I said that, but. Um, we, I, I have to imagine that um, expanding people's thinking at that forefront stage uh, certainly helps um, in prepping them for the pitch room. Thanks. Andrew, uh, the next question is for you from Jessica, who's another member of Siegel and Gale, by the way. Andrew, what are some of the ways end users inside agencies can make their incidents of Igloo customized just for them? How do you customize things according to a specific agency? Well, I put um, 
I would sort of refer to as configuration because any good social internet today is able to be configured by the end user. And I'd probably put it into two categories. The first is the work you do up front um, when you're designing the solution to, to fit the business problem. And that's which tools do you use in which workspaces, how do you organize the different teams in different, um, as, or different parts of the internet, how do you brand it in such a way that it feels and reflects the, the culture of the organization and look and feel. That work is done up front, and that generally doesn't change uh, tremendously. The work that Mae Jessica is referring to is in the individual workspaces. Um, so think of the, the natural flow of any agency. They're constantly uh, bidding for new business and prioritizing new projects, assembling new teams, working on uh, those, those uh, contracts and the different elements of that, those contracts together. You need a tool that can keep up with that. And if everything needed to go through IT, uh, that, would be, that would be a real problem. And so in answer to Jessica's question, the Igloo platform is a drag-and-drop widget-based platform. Um, and if you have permissions, and they're, they're all controlled centrally, um, you have the ability to be able to drag-and-drop new applications onto a page. So for example, a new blog, a new microblog, uh, a place to be able to store your files. That all can be done by the end user uh, with minimal training and the right permissions. Thank you for that. You for that. Christian, your, te your title is uh, unusual in the agency world. What tips would you give an organization looking to focus on knowledge management when they don't have a dedicated role like yours? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's very true. Um, I would, well, I would say, for one, uh, certainly use people, uh, feel free to tap your network for people who are in the knowledge management world, because something that we all have in common is um, we tend to believe in reciprocity, uh, because that's a kind of core foundational thing to knowledge sharing. And so people in knowledge management tend to be happy to share what they know. Um, with others. Beyond that, though, you know, departments like um, internal communications, marketing, um, can all be pivotal to um, growing a knowledge management function. And at the end of the day, the people who are on the ground delivering um, your product, whether that's a, a widget or a service um, or a software as a solution, um, they they have to be core to that because they're the ones who know what value. Um, you know, new ideas can bring and, and how you create or identify opportunities for better collaboration. Thank you. So Andrew, this is more of a big picture question, but what exactly does social bring to the workplace? How is it going to improve what I already do? Yeah, well, let, let me start with a sort of a somewhat of a common mis misperception about what what social is. Social in the workplace is not Facebook for your business. That's not what we're talking about here. Um, in fact, social is really just uh, a way to be able to describe a more open form of sharing of knowledge. It's really what it is. And I liked Christian's story about the New York versus the London office. So imagine a scenario with the London office, and this was great, Christian. Um, they all ride the tube. And every day they're able to spend that face time updating each other on what's going on. And so they get into their office and they have that, that, that platform, that way of being able to exchange information. But it's not that common. You don't find that in the New York office. Um, and the very nature of communication has got so much more complicated. People are constantly on the road. They're working different hours. Uh, they're working in different locations on different geography. Knowledge transfer is really a, a currency. The faster you can exchange knowledge and, and act on it, that may mean the difference between success and failure in winning a contract. Uh, and so social is about sharing information and not keeping it locked up on your hard drive or in your head. Um, and in fact, it actually starts to drive different behaviors. So whereas in the past, and this is not a comment on agency specifically, but in the past, you may be rewarded for being a domain expert. And that may make you want to keep that information inside your head so that you can maintain that, that advantage. What social does is it rewards you for sharing information, uh, for commenting, for 
uh, being able to post a blog about what's going on with a particular account uh, because you become more valuable by spreading that knowledge across the organization. So that's truly the value of bringing social into the workplace. Great. Christian, so you have offices in different cities, different countries. Obviously, um, you're dealing with different cultures, uh, potentially different, sometimes different languages and workflows. How do you account for that? How do you tie them all together? <laughs> you tell me. No, um, that's that's a really <laughs> it's a really challenging thing. Um, so I think partly you have to be willing to um, to delineate and say, um, in some instances, like you know, you guys get to do this differently um, because just as important as it is for people to um, or an organization to find uh, standards and common ways of doing something, it's also important for every uh, uh, office to feel its own identity and um, and it's something that I know Single and Gill is really good at that you go to the London office and without feeling uh, like a different company it doesn't not feel like Siegel and Gill but they're able to say well in London we do something this way um, so I would say celebrating those differences goes a really long way when you do want people to start um, doing something uh, commonly the other thing too is just um, really communicating a value prop. So um, everyone, in our case, everyone is here to serve the clients, right? So if I can frame a new process or um, a new tool or platform as something that enables them to better serve their clients, I'm going to get such better uh, adoption of that um, initiative than if I just said it's cool or um, it's interesting because otherwise people start thinking about their own needs and maybe it's not the most um, time effective thing for people to log into a system and input information or I don't know what but um, but if I say instead hey this is going to benefit your client and you're going to be able to deliver better work then that piques their interest because that's why they're here. Um, so really thinking about that value prop, I think, is essential to, um, you know, trying to t ever tie together um, very disparate offices, um, either by space or, you know, even by um, function. Thank you. So the next question is really for both of you. How do you get senior leadership buy-in on doing something like this? How do you start? Christian, do you want to start by, by how you did it within your organization? Sure. Um, so the biggest, I mean, for leadership, you know, it's funny. Leadership, you know, we're, we're trained to, like, come prepared with a bunch of numbers and um, have, like, estimates of ROIs and stuff. And that is important, and you can't ignore it. Um, but because at the end of the day, you need leadership to champion a lot of the stuff because... Um, in general, people are able to do their jobs without intensive knowledge sharing, and you know we all sputter along. Um, we'll struggle here and there, or you might even lose an account, um, like in your example, Andrew, uh, because you didn't know the expert was two desks down. But work still happens. Um, in, in order to get people to change behavior, you really need a leader uh, leader that's um, that's shouting from the tops of the mountains that um, this is the best way to do something um, because that does motivate people. So um, for me it's been a lot of those um, kind of the anecdotal evidence behind um, how knowledge management um, and improved information sharing can benefit the employee and benefit the clients. Um, where the client-facing people are thinking about clients all the time, leaders are thinking about two people. They're thinking about clients and they're thinking about their employees as well. So if you can demonstrate value for both of those, um, and if you go high up enough, you have to also talk about your shareholders, um, then you know the more you can say this is going to either um, make us more money or make our employees happier, or make our, give our clients better output, um, the more you can tackle those three things, 
the better off you are uh, getting their buy-in. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's. Yeah, I think it's right, um, Christian. Absolutely, and you know, it's interesting. We have had questions from prospects who basically say, "Hey, look, can you can you get me an ROI calculator on on this investment? Like, what's that going to do? Once I deploy this this uh, this new solution, how is that going to help help my business?" And we do get that question, and of course, the answer to it is is very very specific to that company. What workflow? What outcome are you hoping to impact? Have you already measured it pre-system? Now we have to measure it again post-system. It's a very, very specific uh, measure that they're looking for and that, that we need to do. But more often than not, it's not that end outcome that they are coming to us about. It's about the internal communication system not working. The one that they have today is just not working. It's, it's why all of the cloud apps are being brought into the organization by the end user today. Why, why is you know, the likes of Yammer and Dropbox and Box and um, all of the cloud applications, why are they being brought into the organization by the end user? Because the system that's there is not working. Why is there so much SharePoint disadvantage? It's not working. And so the internal pain we find more often than not is the initial trigger that drives adoption and, and gets even the senior leaders within the organization to, to want to seek an alternative. And then once that's adopted, you know, you start small, you measure, you model best practices and make sure that, of course, as Christian said, the folks at the top of the organization are modeling it for everybody else. That needs to happen. Wonderful. Well, that's about all the time we have. So I wanted to, again, thank both of you for all of your hard work and preparation uh, with your presentations. Christian Young, Global Knowledge Manager, Siegel and Gale, Andrew Dixon, Senior Vice President, Marketing and Operations for Igloo. Of course, thank you to our attendees. We hope that you participate in future events. Have a pleasant day. Thanks. Bye-bye.